Thank you all for coming today for this Talks at Google um, on anxiety and kids, um, where Dr. Jana Kortz will be talking about her book, Heroic Henrietta, which is a, a children's book aimed at helping kids and parents deal with anxiety um, in their kids or for the kids and themselves. Um, so I want to introduce um, Dr. Jana Kortz, who runs her own practice in Boston, Azimuth Psychology, um, and Annie Hersham, who is a teacher who helped with the illustrations. So I will let them come up and uh, get this talk started. Thank you for coming. Um, so like Daniel said, my name is Dr. Jana Kortz. I am a licensed clinical psychologist, and I also specialize in treating children and adolescents. I own a boutique group therapy practice that's in Cambridge, Boston, and Nantucket, and we have about 10 clinicians that work for us, and they treat um, children, teenagers, and adults, both for therapy and neuropsych and psych testing, which I actually will touch upon a little bit later about what that is. Um, and this is Annie, so uh, I, she'll introduce herself in a second. I just wanted to start by actually telling the story of how we met, which is sort of which is relevant to this conversation. Um, so. I had always wanted to make a book like this, um, and actually we're turning it into a series, which I will also touch upon later, because anxiety is a really big issue for a lot of people, and especially children, and it's very misunderstood, it's misdiagnosed, and I thought it would be really important to have an easy access book where kids could understand what was happening to them, and also parents could understand and help their kids with it. So I was taking a shower last summer, it was very hot out, I was you know, getting ready to go to a dinner party, and this book just came to my like just came to me, and um, a lot of the stanzas rhyme, and it was all flowing through my mind. I was like really jazzed about it, so I get out of the shower. I'm like, we're gonna be late for this thing, and my husband was so mad, and I was like just, like dripping now, like writing it all down. It was really exciting, so I'm like really excited about this book, and I can't wait to tell my friends about it. So I, you know, I bust into this dinner party super late. Um, you know, and everyone's sort of looking at me like a Kramer entrance, you know, and I'm like, I, I came up with this book about this unicorn that has anxiety and it's for kids and I came up with it in the shower, isn't that awesome? And everyone just stared at me and was very like sort of scattered, you know, and except for Annie, who I'd only met a couple of times before, who came up to me and said, was really interested in hearing more about it. So I told her a little bit about my idea. She read a stanza, she took my notebook, she sketched out what you see behind you, and she <laughs> explained, yeah, explained uh, to me that she was a teacher and she also felt this book was really important. And obviously we went for it and we have another one coming out in a month or so. And so I will let Annie do a brief introduction of herself and then we'll get going. Uh, so as Dana said, I'm Annie Hershorn. Um, I am here because I illustrated the book, um, but I also do come from the perspective, as Jana said, of having taught for the past seven years. I taught in independent schools in Seattle, and then most recently spent three years here in Boston teaching in charter schools. Um, so when we sort of get to the Q&A, which is often the most fun with kids at least, I'm sure with adults too, um, I would love to talk about, answer questions about illustrating, but also I do have that perspective and I'm gonna share a bit about just sort of what the teacher viewpoint is, working with kids who show symptoms of anxiety, what it looks like working with parents, um, and so if you have questions about that as well. Yeah, and we're pretty informal, so if you guys wanna interrupt, feel free, and you can throw those, although I prefer if you just interrupt it. Um, so the way we're gonna work it today is uh, we'll start and talk a little bit about anxiety, namely generalized anxiety disorder, and we'll talk about symptoms, both in terms of cognitive and physical symptoms of that. We'll then talk about the treatments that people use or ways that they can help themselves, which will be told through Henrietta's journey in her book there. So that's sort of the main outline, and obviously, guys, if you have questions, to interrupt. So we also are gonna focus mainly on generalized anxiety disorder. There, are, we'll just call it GAD for short. Um, there are a lot of other kinds of anxiety disorders that exist, so things like social phobia, OCD, those are pretty popular ones that people know about. So we are not gonna to touch upon that today, so we're just gonna really focus on this because this is what the book is about, and usually this is what affects a lot of individuals. I will also say that we're talking about children, but a lot of this applies to adults as well. You would just sort of sophisticate the language, so I don't know if that will be relevant, but I won't say that every time, but just know it does apply to adults as well. And then this thing I wanted to ask everyone, does everybody, does anyone know what the DSM is? Have you guys heard of that? You do, you do, okay. 
Um, for those of you who don't, it is the book that lists all the recognized uh, psychological disorders, and they come out with a new one every couple of years. And so this is the criteria, they say, you know, the symptoms that you must meet the, to have criteria for, a, for GAD. Um, one thing just to keep in mind, just I think it's kind of interesting, so the book changes over time. So they will take in and out different diagnoses, and the most common, like the most popular one from the last iteration of all this is Asperger's, which is a really popular diagnosis for quite some time, but they actually took it out of this most recent DSM. And now those individuals are supposed to be encompassed more under autism spectrum or social communication disorder. So things vary over time. But right now, this is what, what we're looking at. And this is sort of what a lot of the physicians and psychologists recognize and think about when they think about generalized anxiety disorder. So not surprisingly, this is about excessive worry and being unable to control that worry. There is also a variety of other symptoms that are pretty typical, including, you well, can read them, restlessness, I can't even read them. Oh, being easily fatigued, right? Concentration, irritability, muscle tension, sleep disturbances. That can also be appetite problems as well. And really, it's sort of having these things happen to you and also sort of meeting the threshold of impairing functioning. So that's sort of the threshold that psychologists also think about. Does this impact you really quite a bit to the point that social stuff is very difficult, occupational stuff is very difficult, school, things like that. So that's kind of the threshold there. And just relating to that, this is sort of the beginning of definitely where the psychologist and the teachers and parents all come together. We obviously can see a lot of these at school. Um, I found I was spending a lot more hours with a lot of the kids than their parents, um, just naturally how the hours of school go. So, so of course we do see some of this. Um, but of course, it's where it's really important for us to be communicating that to parents and also parents sort of communicating what they see to us. Other s symptoms are, that are pretty common are somatic symptoms, which I'm sure a lot of you know about. But basically, somatic symptoms are physical manifestations of psychological difficulties. And important to keep in mind, too, is that these are can be pretty severe. And these are things that people do experience. So the example I like to give is, I think we've all had a time where maybe we've had like the stomach flu or something pretty gross like that, and it's really painful and just knocks us out. And so people who have anxiety can have symptoms that severe, but without sort of the virus or the medical component. So we'll see a lot of kids who come in, they've been to four or five different doctors, and nobody can kind of come up with a reason why they might be having stomach aches or headaches or something like that. And that's when they sort of get referred to us for therapy because they think that you know the mind-body connection there is pretty strong. That's again, you know, a lot of this we will see at school kids asking to put their head down. No, oh, I just feel tired. We notice that, you know, they're regularly like not taking the school lunch and not just because it looks unappetizing. There's like a real change. Um, and that's often a time uh, where we do sort of reach out to parents and, hey, have you noticed anything? And we've found that sometimes parents don't realize that it's, that it's good to communicate with the school. Things like, oh yeah, Bobby hasn't slept for three nights. Like, that might be part of it. And we're like, oh yeah, that would have been really good to know. Um, that, that, that makes sense. Um, so I think we feel like, you know, that it's a really important opportunity where we share what we're seeing, but really, really helpful to the school um, when parents give feedback and we start to get a more complete picture. Yeah, and I think sometimes that can be missed too because kids have a lot of, they're not, necessarily sophisticated, sophisticated enough to have the language to speak very specifically about these things. So it's sort of like, you know, my, my body hurts, I don't want to go to school, sort of crying, not really being able to articulate these things. And I think that's sort of also where, you know, school um, participation and things like that come into play. So here we go with Henrietta. So the first, well, I would say it's the first treatment, kind of treatment technique that we put in the book um, was partly cognitive behavioral therapy, which is CBT for short. I know a lot of you are pretty familiar with CBT, but basically the idea behind it is to sort of figure out how your cognitions are affecting your actions, behavior, emotions, and where that's getting people into trouble. And a lot of that's based in what we call cognitive distortions, which, I mean, there are many of them, but things like black and white thinking, catastrophizing, fortune telling, which is sort of thinking you can predict the future, generalization, things like that. So we kind of look at those cognitions and then we say, okay, what, what is the percentage chance that this is gonna happen? What are alternative explanations? And is this really a risk factor for you? So if we'll take Henrietta here for, for, as an example. So she's afraid she's gonna get an F. 
So, you know, we see this a lot in kids, but their train of thought is pretty long and distorted and that, you know, I'm going to fail this test and then my teacher is going to be mad at me and then I'm not going to have any friends and I'm not going to be able to go to school and my life will be over. And, you know, that's really how they feel. And so what we do is we first try to search for some facts, right? And we wouldn't necessarily do this with a kid who is not proficient at school, but we'll just assume that Henrietta is a good student. And we would say, okay, like, have you historically failed a lot of tests? You know, what are your grades? And sort of wondering about that in terms of what you're afraid of is not necessarily congruent to what's happened to you before. We might also talk about other things that could happen. You know, okay, so you could get an A, you could fail, but could you get a B? Could you get a C? Could you get a D? What does that look like? Is there extra credit? Like, is the test canceled because there's a fire alarm? Like, it could be a number of things. And then we would look at sort of the percentage chance of each of those things happening. And with kids, you know, who are younger, you'd sort of modify the language, but they can kind of understand if you do like pie charts and things like that. And over time, you know, you want to let them understand that the percentage chance of these very individual things lining up to have this catastrophic ending sure is possible, but probably not very likely. And so how likely is it really? And you would just sort of put percentages based on those things to kind of get a more realistic understanding of what is going on. So Henrietta is doing that. She's searching for facts. She's doing a great job. Deep breathing is another one that's really popular, especially with kids. Um, and it's part of the mindfulness movement, which I know a lot of people are also familiar with. And I will actually touch upon that at the end. So kids are actually really good at this because a lot of ki kids, as they're younger, they breathe out of their bellies instead of their chests. And as we become adults, we breathe more with our chests. And belly breathing actually triggers the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the nervous system that's associated with resting. And so they're already sort of predisposed to be good at this. And so we have them sort of lie down. Oftentimes with younger kids, we'll do the visualization piece. So you can see here, Henrietta uh, has her little boat and her island and, um, yeah, and, and the plane. And, you know, we have kids lie down and they take, you know, like Beanie Babies or whatever kids have these days, little toys. And you'd have them put it on their stomach and they would try to, try to see if they could make the animal go up and down. And that's sort of how you teach it to them. And it can be really helpful. I think a lot of people may see it as like a little hippy dippy, but it does actually work. There's a lot of research about that. So we had Henrietta try that out. She's killing it. And I find that adults, <laughs> when I have talked to them and shown them the book, are like, this is, this is me. Like, this is the one I like the best. This is what I yeah. need in my life. So yeah. I, I find this is often a page that adults identify with. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, a lot of it does apply to adults. Um, and you know, you can do it with or without the visualization piece as well. This is my favorite one. So asking for help is actually something that a lot of people don't consider would be very difficult for kids, but especially if they're anxious, they like the idea of asking for help and being exposed is like horrifying to them. So just making a plan of where they get anxious the most, who can they ask, how can they ask, when do they ask, and having a really concrete plan, and that's really helpful because not only do they feel better having the plan? You know, so they, that helps reduce their anxiety. But they also feel comfortable that the plan that they have is not going to expose them in some way. Like the other students aren't going to find out. Maybe they have a code, whatever word with the teachers. You know, they can do it any which way. But really, making a solid plan for as many scenarios as possible, like throughout their day or their activities, is a really, really good one. And I mean, it works obviously very well. So and I don't know if you ever had that at school with, you know, a little secret. Yeah, that just situations like needing their time out and whether it was like a formal IEP diagnosis if we were at that phase or it was just sort of they were manifesting some of these symptoms that yeah there are ways that we can work out to take that time um, you know for them to, to take that time that they need and I also I, I did a picture of a coach in this one I sort of um, brainstorm with my own partner and with Jana about you know what is that support network looking like and just sort of a visual reminder that like there are more than there's parents there's teachers there's your doctors but there's also like you have other adults and networks in your life and i think my partner's biased because he's a soccer coach and he was like definitely a coach but the point being that maybe sometimes we forget and especially kids like how wide our network of support is yeah that's a really good point so worry time is also a really great one um and this can be done several different ways so Obviously, it's a little self-explanatory, but basically, you give kids a certain period of time during the day that they can just let those thoughts run wild. So whatever they want to worry about, ruminate about, that's fine. 
obviously you have to tailor that to kids depending on how anxious they are and who they are. So you know, two minutes in an anxious child's life is a really long time. So you'd want to sort of work with them to figure out what is actually manageable. And it could be you know 30 seconds, four times a day. It really just depends. And they would have this time to just let it all out. And then the idea would be like, okay, now I'm going to put it in this box and I'm going to shelve it for later. And this is helpful for a lot of different reasons, but there's also sort of like a meta anxiety that people have. So not only are they anxious, but now they're anxious that they're anxious. And so there can be a lot of additional worry about, you know, if I don't think about these things all the time, I won't find out the solution, I won't be able to help myself. And so knowing that you have this time to do that makes it actually easier to not think about those things uh, over the course of the rest of the day. And a lot of people will talk about like, well, just don't think about it, think about something else. But you know, if someone, tells you not to think about a giant pink polar bear, like just really don't think about that. All you're gonna think about is giant pink polar bear. So it's a really hard thing for kids to do, or anybody really. And um, younger kids, well, teenagers like this too, they pretend they don't, but they do, is when you can actually have a physical box where you know, kids will write down their worries and put it in there, and maybe the box has a lock on it, and that's a way for them to really have this concrete place where things are actually held. And especially for kids who have an imagination, I mean, they all have imaginations, but kids who are really imaginative, that's really helpful too, because they really do imagine it to hold these things for them, which is really nice. Um, and teenagers do like it as well. Yep. So back to mindfulness. Um, again, mindfulness is probably something you guys are familiar with, but the basic concept is trying to keep your mind in the present. And this is especially relevant to anxiety because a lot of anxiety is based on things that have happened in the past as well as things that are going to happen in the future. And very rarely is anxiety based on what is happening like right now. So helping kids kind of focus back to now can be really, really successful in reducing their anxiety. So bubbles is an easy way to do that because it's an activity, kids really like it, and you can kind of try to get them to, how big can it get before it pops, or how far can it go before it pops, or can you get four little bu bubbles and one really big one? And so they're focused on that, and that kind of allows them to become more present in the moment. Other things kids love, textures of food, well they love food, but textures of food is a great way to also do mindfulness, and I really like using raisins because they're kind of weird on the outside, but the texture on the inside is different, they're a little granular, it's sweet, so you have kids really eat something and then really explain what it is they are eating and does the taste change over time in like immense detail, and that can also be a mindfulness activity. Observing details, kind of similar, you live on a busy road, you sit with them outside, and you say how many blue cars can you spot in six minutes or whatever it is. Um, yeah. So those, those are really good activities. I actually, for adults, I always like to add this in. I did not know that you can balance an egg. I don't know if everyone, I mean, I didn't know that until grad school. You can actually balance eggs like this way. And so trying to get an egg to balance is actually really hard. So <laughs> that is also considered a mindfulness activity because you're focusing on these sort of very specific movements of this egg. And so that can bring you back to the beginning. We just wanted to touch upon medications. I am not a psychiatrist. I do not prescribe medications. but. I think a lot of people sort of see anxiety and medication as one, and this is just in the story, you know, Henrietta's skills work really well, so she doesn't need to take any medication. And that is just to point out that sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not, and just to keep those different possibilities in mind. Um, again, they can be really helpful and really necessary for a lot of people for a lot of things, but sometimes just giving kids just a little bit more coping skills and different strategies is really um, pretty effective, and that's enough. And in teaching, it's I have seen a wide range of, uh, especially because I've mostly taught sixth grade, so the kids are really coming in to middle school, their bodies are really starting that change, so the physical, emotional, social, so it's a time when a lot of things like anxiety might start to really manifest. Uh, at the same time, it's a time when parents are not sure about medication, they're concerned, they're just maybe starting to talk to a pediatrician, they're reluctant to talk to a pediatrician. Um, and then sometimes when we do have students who families do make the choice to try medication, um, it's another time where it's really important for us to be reporting what we're seeing at school and them to be reporting back to us. You might be seeing a theme of what teachers love when it comes to parents, like tell us what you see. Um, because it is a time, you know, I've seen students who are really assisted in some ways by medication and at the same time, there are side effects that are concerning. You know, they're, they're not eating, they're not showing that same aspect of their personality, and it's just an important conversation. It can have a wide range of impacts on a wide range of kids, and it's so, so great when parents and teachers can have that back and forth. Right. So other considerations that we'll talk about really briefly before the question 
section if you guys have any. Um, anxiety versus ADHD, which is my favorite thing to talk about. And also our role as caregivers and some things to keep in mind if you're having, or you're around kids who have anxiety. So anxiety and ADHD, especially in children, can look virtually the same. So things like difficulty concentrating, irritability, hard time sitting still, not able to pay attention, not able to remember anything, those can, you know, both of those fall into these symptoms of anxiety or ADHD. So our practice actually gets a ton of referrals for neuropsych testing, which is basically these standardized measures that we give kids that help us understand how their brain is working. So things like verbal ability, nonverbal ability, processing speed, all the things with executive functioning that have to do with ADHD, so planning, organization, impulsivity, things like that. And that's how you really get a clear diagnosis of ADHD. And a lot of now a lot of psychiatrists won't actually prescribe, especially to kids without that. So we get we see a lot of that in our practice of what's going on for this person. And honestly, more times than not, we're taking away ADHD diagnoses because it really is a lot of anxiety. And we actually have separate tests to test that too, which are psych tests. Um, and so we will kind of use both of those tools to figure that out. But kids in general, you know, they have like three or four symptoms that they have no matter what's going on for them. So they're externalizing, so they're causing be their behavior problems, they're causing a ruckus. They're internalizing, so they're anxious or they're depressed. Um, or they are just sort of not paying attention and. I wouldn't say dissociating, but they're kind of in their own world, they're kind of spacey. And over time, all those symptoms become more and more specific and sort of blossom into different things. So it often, lo things look very similar in the beginning. So something to keep in mind. And then also just as our role as caregivers, um, you know, our own anxieties can be transferred to children really easily. They are very perceptive and they pick up things that are amazing that you think they would never pick up. And so, and I know for like my own self, like my mom grew up in the Bronx in like a pretty bad neighborhood, so she's really adamant about lock checking. So doors, windows, cars, even though we grew up in a neighborhood where people left their doors open all the time. And so I now, and Annie will tell you yesterday, I always, ch I'm a lock checker, especially with the doors, at least two or three just times. One more time. Checking. Yeah, just one more time. Um, and that's not because I really think that it's not locked, it's just sort of this anxiety I picked up from my mom. So we can definitely do that to our kids or other kids are taken care of and it's not our fault, but just something to be mindful of. So if we're able to sort of manage that a little bit, we can. Um, also the, the role of uh, reassurance, which is really hard to negotiate because, you know, when a kid comes to you and they're distressed and, you know, they're wondering like, you know, is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? You always want to say, like, no, it's okay. Things are going to be fine. But the problem with that is if they are coming to you often and they're doing that a lot, then they're not actually learning how to manage the anxiety themselves. And then they're sort of relying more on you. And then that becomes a problem, too, because, you know, you're not there all the time. And maybe they're in a classroom where the teacher isn't doing that. Or maybe they're at a sleepover and no one can answer that question for them. And they have a really hard time, you know, managing. And, and it kind of explodes and gets worse. So. It's a kind of a funny line to find. I don't necessarily know, I don't have any specific guidelines about where that line is, but it's just something to think about and also work with teachers and psychologists and alike, yes. That's my final plug. <laughs> and I have found that it, with all these things, you know, it's, it is really, really great and important um, when we're having that communication. You know, parents telling us what they see, if they have concerns, us being able to share back, it's just like we pretty much cover the whole day if we do that. Um, and I think also, parents being able to share concerns, um, make use of things like school social worker, school counselor, psychologist. That said, I've worked in a school that didn't have any of those things. Um, and so, you know, hoping that you all feel empowered as parents of like, if that's not something that they have to say, like, have you thought about networking with other places? Do you have um, an outside um, group that you bring in um, to be advocating for your child of like, what an important thing that is um, to, to have an offer to students. Yeah, absolutely. And just along those lines too, I mean, we've said this the whole time, but just being mindful to monitor symptoms and also see if there's some kind of correlation between when things are going on, like in terms of symptoms and also things going on in the world. So the first thing that a psychologist will ask you when you bring your kid to therapy is to, are those connections, do they exist? Do you know about them? And if not, then they have everyone start to monitor those anyway. So things like time of day, exercise level, you know, it could be anything, seasons, food they ate that day, et cetera. It's important to keep that in mind as well. So that is mostly what we have for you today. In the back of the book, there are two worksheets, which are just to help kids 
check off and kind of have a behavior chart of coping strategies that Henrietta uses in the book. And so that's in there too. Um, if anyone has any questions about getting help or anything about the presentation, my cards are up here. And we do have a new book coming out. His name is called Dorky Orky, and he's a half narwhal, half orca who has social skills problems. There he is. He fell down the stairs. Someone pushed him. Anyway, Before it is sad, is, but. He's, he's becoming aware of his body. Yeah. Um, so he's getting there. He gets there, more or less. He, he's very popular at the end. He has yes. a lot of friends. He, yeah. found, he finds his support network. So. And that's it. Um, so you had talked about the difference that ADHD and anxiety can be confused. Um, I asked specifically because my son has been diagnosed with ADHD, and I'm curious what those differences are and how you um, see differences between them. In terms of the testing, like how we would know that? Or testing would be interesting. I guess I'm also curious just what the symptoms are or how they do get confused. Sure. So. I think what can happen a lot of times too is we get stuck on the symptom that interferes with school the most and that can, and you know, with both kids and anxiety, right, they're not necessarily concentrating, they're not paying attention, or they're running around, and so that's what we get stuck on and that's a very clear symptom of ADHD and so, but it can also be part of anxiety and if we take a step back and say what else is going on, what other things does this look like and kind of keep some of these things in mind, it helps us sort of decide one way or another because when you start to pay attention to what kids are doing, and like as you know, right, you can start to see like maybe they are anxious about these things. I never thought about the fact that he was asking about the doors or whatever it was, or the coffee pot being on or the oven being on. But now that I think about it, that makes sense. So there's like some observational piece. The testing is also super helpful because it just gives a cognitive outline of how they're doing. And so even if you don't do like the psych piece, let's say, let's say you're just doing the neuropsych, you know, all of their executive functions could be great. They could like totally do so well on the attentional measures. So then it's something else. And then we wonder how do we find out about the something else. And so that's kind of how we negotiate it, at least on our end. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Um, I wonder if you can speak to the differences that you might see in the, in the, um, you know, the treatment of, of boys versus girls. Um, I have three daughters, and one of them has what I think is probably GAD. So I'm just curious if, if you have any idea about the uh, gender differences. Sure. When kids are pretty young, they actually the gender difference just in general is less than when they get older, obviously. So a lot of what we're doing for younger kids is pretty much the same, I would say. Um, are you talking in terms of treatment or just sort of uh, how it manifests outwardly? Uh, I guess both. Both. Uh, tween, if you will. <laughs> sure. Um, and well, it's hard with girls too, right? Because that's sort of how we are at that age a little bit, right? There's a lot of that stuff that goes on anyway, and so it's a little hard to differentiate between what's normal developmentally appropriate stuff and what is something else. So I think in terms of what you see at that age, you do see differences because girls are unfortunately because of gender stereotypes and things like that, they are more likely to be talking about their feelings or yeah, at least expressing them, whether they're telling you why or not. You know, they're crying, they're yelling, they slam the door in your face, they do all these things. Where got, got, like, boys tend to be a little more inward in that or they become sort of the, uh, like, all the way down the other spectrum of sort of more explosive. So there's less talking about feelings and things like that, so they're either, you know, sometimes like beating up their brother and sister or they're just isolating themselves in their rooms but there's not a lot of discussion about those things because that's not really something that we unfortunately we don't really promote that in our society for the most part so if you're talking about tween age that's kind of where that stuff starts a little bit as a treater we would be doing a lot of the same things and the way in is just a little bit different you know because the guys come in sometimes and, and it's true for women too but it tends to be that teenage boys come in and they're made to come to therapy and F you and I'm not doing this. And so how you like connect with that person is a lot different than you know, someone who's a little more tearful or who wants to tell you at least something about their day or something like that, which the girls tend to be a little bit more like, at least in my experience. I have a six-year-old boy and he's acting like a teenager because he doesn't want to tell us ever anything about his day. And like sometimes things get out like, uh, randomly, but like so, um, and and I think that things are bothering him. Um, um, I mean, he used to talk about it more 
uh, when he was younger and then he sh shut down. So what can you do to trigger kids to talk about their day and their to talk a little bit more about what's going and on. what scares them if they face anxiety during the day yes yeah, so that's a tricky one because he's probably young enough this is not so true but as kids get older like they're less interested in talking to their parents and so a lot of efforts to facilitate that stuff when especially when you have teenagers goes on it is not very fruitful i guess your efforts don't tend to be fruitful and that's when I tend to say, you know, maybe it's worth at least seeing if there's somebody else, like a school counselor or a coach or a mm -hmm. therapist or somebody that could kind of get involved if you think that something's going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of how to answer that question as a parent, the kid who's not. Well, I mean, well, yeah. I again, I speak on, like from the perspective of a teacher and um, I, I don't know, I, I know every school is different, but just sort of asking if teachers have seen something similar, is there a teacher or an aide or whatever it is that mm -hmm. they do talk to, are they seeing, um, because I, I, I've made a lot of plugs about parents communicating to us, but I know that at least for me personally, there were times when I definitely could have communicated things better to parents, mm -hmm. and it's not till they email that I'm like, oh yeah, I should have mentioned to them that like, I've noticed particularly at lunchtime, mm -hmm. you know, Sarah mm -hmm. really shuts down, or she doesn't want to go to the cafeteria, she doesn't want to go outside. Um, so, you know, maybe seeing, especially because you said a bit younger, your son, um, what are they seeing? Are they, you know, having the time of their lives at school and then kind of a little different at home? My mm -hmm. brother was definitely that way. Mm -hmm. um, my, their, my parents thought their kindergarten teacher was talking about like a different child. They're like, no, that's not our son. The one who's like super happy at school, like it's not. Right. So, that, I mean, they, they can be good resources. I know some teachers mm -hmm. do it better than others. And I would also add, just to answer the question, um, I think a lot of times kids also don't know that they're able or not able to do things. So, and they don't have the vocabulary to do it either. So a lot of what we do for younger kids is sort of teaching them feelings words and, how, and also how like symptoms or feelings in their like, body sensations are correlated to emotions. So sometimes we're, we get angry, we get really hot, you know, we feel like we're sweaty or whatever it is, and having them start to be a little more self-aware about those things because mm -hmm. sort of similar to the somatic symptoms we were talking about, kids don't necessarily, they just know that something's wrong and they don't know, like it's not really their stomach, it's not really a headache, but they don't want to go to school, so they're upset, and so they don't necessarily, it's just that they don't have the language for it. So that's something that would, might be a good place to start is just sort of, making it known that he's allowed to do these things like talk about his feelings mm -hmm. maybe you can write them down or maybe you know maybe it's at this one time of day but also sort of helping him figure out how to do that i think that tends to be a pretty good place to start because that's mostly what we end up doing in the beginning because kids just don't and it's not their fault it's just developmentally they just haven't learned that stuff yet or draw i definitely have kids mm -hmm. i mean personally that's my coping but like i have kids who sometimes they they won't write about it especially if they're a bit younger but like they'll draw about it or if you even just like draw how you're feeling and yeah. maybe they start tearing up the paper and that can be very indicative and um, yeah. so that can be one way for kids to yeah anything is like a great starting point for a conversation so so when you were talking about mindfulness and blowing bubbles um, what's your opinion on video games for that my son loves to play Minecraft as sort of and I think it's to forget everything else I think like everything moderation is important I can appreciate the technical and interest of Minecraft um, I also know that kids use it as an escape mechanism often. And so having something to focus on and work on is one thing, but then having it be kind of take over other things or take over time where you would be spending with your family or interacting with friends outside or playing outside or with the dog or whatever it is. There's sort of a line there, and I think finding where that is and finding the reason behind like the Minecraft, because like, a lot of kids find it super interesting, and I, I get that. But there tends to be like sometimes another component to it, or it's a distraction to put off doing homework because they don't feel like they're good at math or something like that. Um, and this is true for video games in general. People kind of, the newest thing is kind of talk about kids who are addicted to video games. And I like to think of it more as, you know, not to say he's addicted to them, but just as a concept. You know, it's, there's a reason kids do things. There's a reason we all do them. And video games are a great way to have a, you know, a world in which you can be successful where you don't actually know anybody, but you sort of know them, you're like online friends, that's a little bit different, and it's escapism, and you know, a lot of de kids who are depressed are, are using it as a tool to sort of escape. And so, kind of wondering about the utility of it, I guess, would be what I would say about it. But it is a, it's hard because it's also a social thing where they're all doing it, so you can't have them not, if they like it, you don't want to say don't do it, but you also don't want it to be what they're doing. 
So, and Minecraft is, I don't, it's not for me, but I get how it's really addictive for other people in that way. Like, they're really into it. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.